there's going to be this referendum. And if it gets approved, if people vote yes for it, the red line is going to not be part of the MBTA anymore. It's going to be its own independent city. So people will live on it, and there'll be businesses down there, and the platforms, and the cars, and stations themselves. What are your thoughts on that? I think people like to feel like they have the right... I, I, that's like... That is privilege right there. Like, I think that is they're so focused on so many other things. They're thinking about building a city in the red line. Like, that is that privilege right there. That is that is unfair. And I'm, I don't mean to target out anybody, but you, we all know who probably proposed that nonsense. So, go ahead and tell me, please. white people. I am sorry, but that is that white privilege. <laughs> Previously, in Greater Boston, you need someone to give shape to your message, to give an image to your vision, to tell the story of what Red Line will be. I know how to create that scene, that sense of place, that complete narrative in a single, perfectly realized location. Like I was supposed to know this guy couldn't hack it on a mid-grade coaster. I mean, pregnant ladies go on the world of dawn. They're not supposed to, but we had this one lady who was totally pregnant just a week before. She was so badass, she made being preggers look good. There's a note. Danahy. What? That's it. Just Danahy. I get it. I I have to go. Brain tree. Right. Peabody. Haverhill. Lowell. All right. Limits. Fall Coastal. River. Cambridge. Quincy. I can't see that one without a river. Uh, Arlington. Arlington. It's impossible. Framingham. Newton. Lynn. Worcester. This is Framingham. Waltham. Quincy. Arlington. Waltham. Revere. Revere. Somerville. Arlington. This Revere. is Lemonster. Haverhill. Brookline. Medford. Somerville. Cambridge. This is. This is. This is. Greater Boston. This week in Greater Boston, the mayor of the Red Line draws a crowd in Rally Up Park Street. Mallory recounts her political awakening in Over and Down, and Nika sends a message to Dimitri in The Puzzle Box. All of that in Episode 9, Leaps of Faith. Station. Park Street Station is next. The Red Line Commuters is a rally on the Red Line platform. Rally a Red Line. Rally a Red Line for Red Line Commuters. Referendum Rally. Rally for the Red Line Referendum. Platforms will be crowded through the Red Line Referendum Rally featuring the Mayor of the Red Line. The Mayor of the Red Line will be speaking at the rally on the Red Line platforms. If you're attending the rally, please leave room for people who need to board the Red Line trains. Watch the doors, the doors are closing. Watch the doors, the doors are closing. Charlotte felt a tightening that might very well be her first contractions. But she didn't have time for that. She was not going to have a baby today. Today she had a press conference to orchestrate a public rally at the Park Street Station, downstairs on the Red Line platforms. The baby was a week past due already, but Charlotte was determined to last another two until after the election, after the results had come in and everything was settled. Until then, she had work to do. The mayor looked up at her from his desk, where he was working on last-minute adjustments to his speech, a speech he would not bother to print, not bother to bring with him to the rally, He knew it by heart already, even as he made his changes. He always knew it by heart. Are you okay, he asked. Are you okay? She had let slip her discomfort, she realized. Allowed some small expression of distress to cross her face. And of course he had noticed it. He always did. Always worried that he was working her too hard, asking too much. Each time he reassured her, when the time came, she would not be replaced. She would not lose her place of honor in his administration. He had known from the start that she would need a leave, and he respected that, respected that she would need to see to the needs of her body and her baby. 
and when she came back, her place in his administration would be untouched, preserved for only her. This shouldn't even have been possible. Any of this. When I started gathering signatures, I really only thought I'd be driving attention to infrastructure investment. Getting the initiative on the ballot was only ever going to be a conversation point, a rhetorical tactic. It never would have gone past that. It never would have been a thing people seriously considered. There wouldn't have been press conferences or opposition groups. You made it real. You made it a movement. You turned this whole crazy idea into a vision. I hope you realize that. Everything we're doing now is because of you. If you want to give me credit, at least wait until we win. We're still down in the polls. 47% opposed, 44% in favor. 9% undecided. 9% undecided. Let's hope they make a decision soon. Most people walk into a voting booth undecided, vote no reflexively on anything. Just so long as you understand, Charlotte. If we lose, that's on me. But if we somehow manage to actually win, I'm putting all the blame on you. Oh, we're going to win. I'm ready for it. That had been three days ago. Since then, they'd picked up one more point in the polling, and the twinges in her cervix had gotten harder to ignore. I'm fine. I'm fine, she assured him now, meeting his gaze. She said she'd just been thinking about the camera angles, wondering if they should have provided a taller riser behind the podium. He smiled at her and shrugged. Whatever she had provided would work just fine, he said. He had no doubt. And anyway, it was too late to worry about it now. It was time to get on stage. She had chosen Park Street deliberately for the staging possibilities it offered. She had set the mayor's podium on the central platform, between the two tracks, accessible to both inbound and outbound trains. Key supporters would be lined along the platform behind him, with general audience filling out the side platforms to be dramatically removed from the frame every time a train came into station. Reporters would stand centrally before the podium with full view of the mayor and his supporters behind him, and the trains coming and going along the periphery of their shots. It would be dynamic and commanding. The mayor was in high spirits when they arrived. He took his spot with a smile to the crowd and a bow to Charlotte, a gentlemanly appreciation for the work she had done to get him there. He was a natural with an audience, and he knew it. All those years of teaching, and he was the kind of teacher students liked, charming even when he was off on some bizarre tangent that carried him miles from the course outline. He knew how to bring it back, bring it home, bring it to a point that resonated. And he certainly wasn't bothered by the noise of the trains. He was used to that. Used to making himself heard over the thrum of engines and the screech of rails. And when the noise drowned him out, he just smiled beatifically, like he was hearing the song of angels, the comforting white noise of home. The baby wriggled inside of Charlotte through the whole speech. It was just the noise exciting it, she told herself. The baby was most definitely not maneuvering itself into birth position. It was not preparing itself for egress. The baby was just applauding. It just knew a good speech when it heard one. Charlotte herself watched the mayor from behind the lectern with the other dutiful supporters at the very back of the arranged audience. She stood behind the supporters even, wanting the cameras to catch more of the faces unaffiliated with the campaign than of hers, the paid administrator. And so when the crowd facing the other direction gasped, she was one of the few who had no idea why at first, even though she was closest to it. She felt the movement, the solid sound of mass landing right behind her, then moving off quickly. She turned just in time to see the continuance of the motion. A young man running across the platform, then leaping into the air, turning a somersault, and landing cleanly on the opposite platform across the tracks. Christ. Christ. Fucking free runner. Fucking free runner. And then the baby kicked. Hard. So hard it actually hurt. Pulled her eyes back from the free runner, turning away from the crowd to wince and clutch at her bruised side. And so she was the only one facing away from the commotion, toward the Alewife platform where the free runner had come from, rather than the Ashmont platform where he had landed. And she was the only one watching when the second boy started dashing across the platform right toward Charlotte, looking her right in the face as he charged. All she could do was shake her head. No, you dumbass! But 
he wasn't listening, wasn't interested in her wild, dissuading gestures. He had too much to prove. Seven News, were you there at Park Street? Fuck off! Seven News, did you see what happened? Were you there? No! Seven News, were you there? Were you downstairs at Park Street? Were you there at Park Street? Yeah, I was there. I saw the whole thing. I mean, you've seen the video, right? The good one, the one that got the whole thing from start to finish? That was me. I videoed that. JoJo's my cousin. Stupid fucking JoJo. He'd been talking about it for months. He's kind of semi-pro with the whole free-running thing. He doesn't actually compete because he thinks that's bullshit. It's his art, right? So we don't want to commercialize that shit. But he could compete if he wanted to, which he doesn't because he keeps it pure. Anyway, I haven't had much to do these past few months since Wonderland shit canned me. So JoJo's taken me on as his personal videographer. I follow him around when he's got a thing planned and he keeps me in beer and chinchilla chow. Anyway, JoJo would wanted to make that jump for ages. It was just too tempting. I mean, even if you're not a free runner, who hasn't gone down there and thought, God damn, I'd like to jump over that. It's just one of those things, right? If you live in Boston, if you're you or me or any other mass hole who's ever gone down in a Park Street station, it's your patriotic duty to think you're totally the guy who could make that jump. But none of us is stupid enough to really try. We know it's stupid. We know we can't actually do it, even if we think we can. JoJo, though? JoJo is stupid enough to try. That wasn't the day we'd been planning to go for it, though. We'd been scouting spots for a different run, something JoJo's been planning up on Beacon Hill. I talked him out of running John Kerry's place. He wanted to do something high profile, and I get that. I'm all for showing your balls, right? But not like when you could seriously get shot for it, you know? Don't fuck around with the Secret Service dudes. And JoJo was all like, Mallory, when have you ever seen a Secret Service dude up there? And I was all like, dude, they're fucking secret. I mean, it's like totally right there in the goddamn name. And JoJo obviously had to grant my point on that one. So he was feeling shitty on the way home because we hadn't settled on anything. But when we got down to Park Street, it was crazy nuts. There was a huge crowd all at one end watching up the middle platform. There was a whole thing set up there and a guy was talking from a podium like some kind of busker, except everyone was actually paying attention. And I realized it was that guy, the mayor of the red line. He was making a speech about this referendum thing, like he wants the trains to make their own city, some crazy shit like that. But he's got all these supporters, including this pregnant lady who's standing right behind him, lip-syncing his whole speech like she knows every word of it. And there were reporters, like the news had cameramen and everything. And when I saw that, I knew it was just too much for JoJo. He wanted a high profile, and here it was. He said, Mallory, I'm going for it. But he didn't even have to say that. I already had my camera running. But there was this douchebag asshole standing right there. You know, the kind we've got three quarters of the year of fucking four-year Sox fans from Ohio with his cap on backwards and already half drunk because class let out almost an hour ago. And that guy's all, going for what? So I told him, JoJo's going to jump the gap. And he's all like, no fucking way. And I'm all like, yes fucking way. JoJo's the real deal. And then he's like, well, big shit if he does. Anyone could do that. So I told him to shut his fucking motherfucking pisshole mouth. And I just gave JoJo the signal that I was on him and ready to go. So JoJo went. And it was awesome. He took a little running start, not that much because the platforms aren't that wide, but it was enough. And he kicked off when he hit the yellow line, which is perfect because it's got those big punji things on it for traction. And he goes up and over, flipping in the air, coming down neat as silk sheets on the other side. And then he just keeps going, hits the next yellow line and does it again, up and over until he's all the way on the Ashmont Brain Tree side. And then I'm like, shit, he's going to miss the train because the intercom is already announcing the next train to Alewife is approaching, which means you've got only 60 seconds till boarding. And there's way too big a crowd for him to get through the stairs, up, over, and back down again in time. And I know what you're thinking. He could have just jumped back over. But JoJo wouldn't do that when he knows the train is already coming. He's stupid, but he's not that stupid. But then douchehead McShitbrain is all... You think that's so great? Just watch this. And I realize he can't let JoJo have his moment. He's got to try to match it because he really is that stupid. And he goes for it, takes the run, hits the yellow line, and jumps. He made it 
maybe three quarters of the way. And in the video, even though his back was to me, you can see the moment when he realizes what a fucking moron he is. Because he starts pedaling his legs, like he thinks maybe if he just runs hard enough on the air, then maybe he won't hit the tracks and die like the fucking little bitch that he is. And he doesn't stop pedaling his legs until his face hits the edge of the opposite platform. And after that, he just lies down there bleeding from his face. And I seriously thought that was the end of him. I mean, the train's already coming, we've got like 45 seconds. No one even saw him go down because they were still watching transit security take Jojo into custody. And even if they had, who's gonna risk their lives for this loser? And then the next thing I know, that crazy ass pregnant lady is jumping down onto the tracks. And I realized I knew her, sort of. She was the same lady who used to bring her little baby bump to Wonderland to ride the roller coaster. Only now she's got a huge ass baby bump and she's saving a frat bro's worthless hide while we all stand around and watch. And then she seriously tossed Douchey McShipbrain right over her shoulder, like I don't even know how, except she's got all that crazy baby juice adrenaline power going. And by then, people realize she's down there, heaving McShipbrain's dead weight up onto the platform. But now she can't get herself back out, and the intercom has already announced that the train to Alewife is now arriving, not just approaching, which means you've got not even 30 seconds till boarding. So then the crowd starts scrambling, with folks up on the platform making change to drag her straight up out of the pit, right just as the train is shooting in and then I lost sight of everyone. And I'd recorded the whole fucking thing. I couldn't even believe it. I know I'll never see anything like that again, but fuck, I am so psyched that I had my camera going, because otherwise no one would ever believe me. Well, other than the news crews were there too, and they got most of it, but not as much as I did, because I was right down at the part of the platform where it was all happening. But I'll tell you this much, if that crazy badass bitch is out here telling me she wants me to vote, then motherfucker, I am getting my ass to that voting booth. Fucking A. If you could wake up tomorrow and make a new law for the entire Greater Boston area, what would the law be about? Oh my gosh, please don't smoke cigarettes. I hate the smell of cigarettes. It makes me so nauseous. No Uggs. Like the boots? Yeah. It'd either be that or no more spitting, because everybody spits. I think it's gross. Speed to your own risk. Just go as fast as you want. No speed. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I have to, God, you give me so much power and I'm going to say something stupid. Like, when you're going to the train, like, everyone should be mindful of everyone around, else around them. So it means they shouldn't be too shovey. Be more polite around people. Don't be so rude. What's another good law? Like, you shouldn't, like, always be loud. But I'm really loud myself, too. Especially in school when people don't listen to me. But they also shouldn't just lollygag in front of you. Like, people have a habit of, like, shoving to get around you, and then they're in front of you, and they're just texting or slowing down, and I'm trying to get to a certain pot spot on the tee. Work Monday through Friday. No weekends. Nobody would have to work on weekends? Yep. I would say a better background check for people who wants to receive some kind of like cards saying they can carry weapons. If you find a metered spot in the morning, you can stay at that spot all day. You don't have to move. You can stay there as long as you keep feeding the meter. Yeah, for a while there'll be more accidents. Everyone will get used to it. Well, or, or the people that don't will die off. Horrible <laughs> accidents. <laughs> exactly. No salads. I no really, salads. I hate salads so much. I feel like I'm eating grass. Like No lollygagging. Like or pushing. Or shoving. Yeah, yeah. pushing, yeah. shoving, or lollygagging. We get the message. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but then what if you want to go somewhere and do something? If it's like you want to go to the movies or something, or events, actually. I mean, oh, except working. for entertainment <laughs> industries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, like, it's not. Sometimes, like, you know when you eat it, it's like, oh, it's not like, I don't know, like Olive Garden salad. A new law, um, it will probably be, I don't know, take a take a day out and enjoy the person that you love the most.
Dear Dimitri, I read the letters you sent to Leon from Oregon, from somewhere out in the ocean. Sounds like you're having a hell of a time, a real adventure. I've never met a Sasquatch hunter, never been on a submarine, I probably never will. I hope you're taking lots of photos. We should have set you up on Instagram before you left. We should have bought you a camera. That, that should have been my present for you instead of that stupid Dr. Seuss book. I thought that was so funny. You still had all six copies people gave you when you finished high school, all of them thinking they were so clever. So I figured I'd get you lucky number seven. Magic number seven, what a gag. I'm a fucking idiot. If I had realized you were really going that time, I'd have gotten you that camera. But you had announced your departure so many times before. The last time you declared you were heading out for adventure, you were gone three weeks. You never made it past Kennebunk. I figured you might make it to Toronto this time. I figured you'd be back in a month with some charming anecdotes about hitchhiking through farm country, squatting in abandoned barns, eating too many canned beans. I figured you'd have a nice little vacation. I figured you would come home. I just assumed you were as much of a coward as I am. Do you... Do you remember the ice mountain from when we were kids? They dumped it in Danahy Park after the blizzard. Too much to keep piling on the curb, too much for the sewers to handle. They steam shoveled it into trucks and carted it off to the soccer field and left it there. A 12 foot landmark that you could see from the other end of the park. We need to climb it, you'd said. Leon was horrified and pointed out how filthy the snow was, tainted with road grime and dog pee. We'll find a yeti, you countered, expecting such rewards to overshadow the risks of dog pee. Leon rolled his eyes at you and told you that yeti weren't real and that even if they were, they'd be on a mountaintop in Nepal, not a trash heap in North Cambridge. Up you went. And when you got to the top, you turned around, automatically putting a hand out to help up whoever had followed you. But no one had. Not Leon. Not me. I'd wanted to. I'd wanted to see the world from up that high. Imagine myself a famous explorer, first to reach the peak of Everest. Reporters gathering round to hear my story. I was too scared. It was so high up. And so unstable. What did would it support my weight? Would it collapse beneath me? I wasn't ready to take that chance. And I was right, Dimitri. I was right, because you had barely been up there half a minute before you vanished straight down into the ice. Leon went right up the wall, no hesitation. You fell down, Leon flew up, and he dropped onto his belly, reaching down as far as he could into the hole to pull you up. And when he couldn't reach, he started to dig. Great scoops of ice dug out with only his hands, flung from the mountain to the ground below where they bounced off my boots. After the first few throws, the ice started coming down with red stains. He hadn't brought his gloves. Other people rushed past me. A dad who'd brought his kids to play on the little playground in the corner of the field. A lady who'd been jogging the path through the park. A couple of scary teenaged boys we'd steered clear of because we'd seen them smoking weed on the hill. They all came running, went right up the mountain to help Leon to help you. I saw them all go. I felt the breeze of their passing shift my coat as they ran past. I stood and I watched. All of them up there on their knees and their bellies digging away in the ice and snow. Eventually, the dad took Leon by the ankles and lowered him into the pit. The others helped him pull Leon back up with you clinging to him. And all of you came sliding back down the mountain. You blue and blubbering. The dad using his scarf to bandage Leon's hands. The stoners threw each other high fives and then left the scene before the paramedics could show just in case the cops came too. You were both on the news that night. The boy who almost died and the fearless brother who saved him. What were you thinking? 
they asked Leon. Do you remember what he said? He said, my brother's an idiot. No one ever asked me what I was thinking. Why would they? I didn't do anything. I didn't know most. I, I didn't save anyone's life. I didn't even help. Here's what I was thinking. I should have been in that hole with you. I should have climbed the mountain and fallen in the mountain beside you, and we could have escaped the mountain together, back to back in the pit, pressing our boots into the walls and spider-crawling our way out. It would have been glorious. But I didn't. I stood at the bottom, watching you go. Watching you fall, watching you get saved by Leon and a crowd of strangers. Is that the moment you gave up on me? Was it, was it that early in our lives, right there in Danahy Park? It wasn't, was it? It should have been. And deep down, I think you always knew it. But you kept trying right up until the end. You kept giving me one more chance, and then one more chance, and then one more chance. Every time, an opportunity to make up for Danahy Park. Even at the party, you asked me to come with you. Twelve hours from leaving forever. And you still tried to convince me to drop everything and run away. You offered me a place in your story. A partnership in your adventure. Did you really mean it? Did you really believe I might say yes? That I had stopped being a coward? Was that my last chance? Was that the moment you gave up on me? Is that why you haven't written to me at all, only to Leon? Leon, who would never have believed half your stories. Who would have said there is no way you're really on a submarine. You must be making it up, playing one of your games. Feeding us one of your unsolvable mysteries. Like when you cut the answer pages out of his book of riddles. He said the same thing about the puzzle boxes you left us. I tried to solve it, you know. Not right away, not the day you left, or the week you left, or the month you left. But after six weeks, eight weeks, when it started to come clear that you had really gone this time, had really left us behind, I finally broke down and I tried to open the box. I hoped that it might hold a, a clue to where you had gone. But I could never do it. I spent weeks, I missed days of work to sit home trying to solve the box. I managed to change its shape, sliding panels, turning whole sections of it over. It was a cube, a pyramid, a rhombus, a cross, and the, the thing that rattled inside it sounded different notes depending on the different configurations of the box. But the box never opened. Of course you never got it open, Leon told me. He doesn't want you to get it open, he just wants you to try. So I did. I tried. I'm trying. But I don't think I'll ever solve your puzzle. And you won't even talk to me. And I don't know why I'm writing this to you. I have no way of sending it. No way that will actually work. But I'll do what you do when someone is out at sea. I will put it in a bottle and carry it along the red line to Charles MGH. And I will get out and walk out onto the Longfellow Bridge. And from there, I will toss the bottle out into the Charles River and hope that somehow it carries this message out to the right part of the ocean, wherever you are. Because here is what I need to tell you, Dimitri. Leon died. You missed the funeral. And I am fucking pissed at you. I hope you get this. Love, Nika. Dear Diary, October 25th. The strangest thing happened in my darkest hour. I stood at the center of the Longfellow last night, waited for one last red line to cross my vision. But the trains were delayed thanks to some rally being held in Park Street Station. That's right, in the actual station. Finally, I gave up. I grew cold. I gazed at the water. I wondered if the fall would even be adequate. I would soon find out. 
And then I saw her, a woman, about 15 feet away from me. She was scribbling a letter, ripping through pages in a frenzy. I recognized her from the seance held at work just earlier that afternoon. The last straw for me, in fact. E.E. E. ordered me around like some psychic drill sergeant. The woman finished writing, rolled her papers, slid them into an empty wine bottle, corked the bottle and tossed it into the Charles. Hard. She had a good arm, actually. Might be an athlete. I walked up to her because I simply had to inquire. Who was that message for? Why was she sending it in such an aspirational method? But then I noticed she was crying and shaking. She looked at me. No recognition. I glanced towards her thrown bottle. Better not jump in after it, she mumbled. God knows I won't be able to save you. It wasn't her words that chilled me, stopped me. It was the bizarre optimism of the act. A message in a bottle. I mean, can you believe it? And she flung that bottle with purpose. She wanted the intended recipient to see what she had written. She honestly believed that this was the best method for delivering her words. I saw this in her arm, in her throw, in her tears. Perhaps now I'm mythologizing this strange woman and her even stranger acts in a way that has led me astray all my life. But the truth is, she saved me. Somewhere out there, in the endless ocean, there is a message waiting for someone to read it. And for now, for me, that is enough. Just enough. Tyrell. Greater Boston is written and produced by Alexander Danner and Jeff Andreessen with recording and technical assistance from Mark Harmon. Please consider supporting Greater Boston on Patreon. We're nearing the end of Season 1 with just three more episodes to go. We plan to keep producing monthly mini-episodes while we're on our between-season break, but if we can hit our next milestone goal on Patreon before the season finale airs, we'll double that schedule to deliver a new mini-episode every other week until the show returns in full. You can also help the show by leaving us a review on iTunes or social media. In order of appearance, this episode featured Alexander Danner as the narrator, James Capobianco as the mayor of the Red Line, Summer Unsin as Charlotte Linzer Coolidge, Joanna Bodnick as Mallory, Kelly McCabe as Nika Stamatis, and Arun Sanuti as Tyrell Fredericks. Also featuring Jim Johansson as the Green Line operator and Jeff Van Driesen as the Red Line operator. Interviews recorded with Greater Boston residents. Charlie on the MTA is performed by Emily Peterson and Dirk Tiedi. Reels and Farewell to Nig by Adrian Howard, Emily Peterson, and Dirk Tiedi. Drum tracks by Jim Johansson. Some sound effects and music used from public domain and Creative Commons sources. Episode transcripts will be posted online at greaterbostonshow.com. Greater Boston is written in part at the Writers' Room of Boston, a nonprofit workspace for Boston area writers. Find out more at writersroomofboston.org. And that guy's all, going for what? And then he's like, well, big shit if... <laughs> I can't really do this twice. And that guy's all... And that guy's all going for... <laughs> <laughs> and that... <clears throat> and that guy's all going for what? <laughs>